So I'm, my name is Alexander Blum. I'm an OpenBSD developer for more than 10 years now Blum at OpenBSD. Uh, I work at a company in Munich. We build firewall and VPN appliances based on OpenBSD. So it's also my, my job to, to make OpenBSD reliable and fast and suitable for our products. So what I want to do, wanted to do is detect changes in performance in OpenBSD when they occur. So when, when everything is something is committed and it affects the performance, I want to see, okay, there was a difference. And, um, and also see how does it develop or re releases. Do we have a regressions here? Is there, has there something happened that is good? And I want to measure real world performance. So, so it's basically network performance that I'm interesting interested. I started with the network stack performance, not the forwarding performance, that's a different story. And um, so I want to see how does our T TCP stack behave. So what, what I will do, I will first of all I will talk about where, where are we coming from, what did we have before. I will also talk about my uh, regression tests. Then how does this performance testing over the time work? What results did I find? And what's the conclusion? What I want to give you on your weight. So it starts with the, the the state that was before I started the testing performance. So at Genua, that's the company I work for, we have a high performance firewall test bed, and we use it for multiple purposes. We want to generate numbers for that we can show our customers that are basically high, and the marketing also was wants high numbers. The developers want to know how the system works, and then we want to see when we buy, when we when we choose new hardware revisions, does it go faster? Does it go not faster? What are the patches we we, we release? Do we have regressions there? We want to have forwarding performance, CPN performance, and everything. So on this, everything results in in bad results for that. What I want, I want results for developers. And what you see here is you can't see really what we are measuring. You have some dots jumping around. You don't know why. You have some, some, some lines in there. And it's also unclear. And by the way, we are testing the, the 6.0 release. It's always the same software. And you have very varying results. It goes up and down. And nobody knows why. So the, the hardware setup is also right, rather complex. Because it's for multiple people doing testing the same, doing tests at the same time. We have different requirements, I just told you before. And we want to, to test also different hardware. So we have several machines where we can install the, uh, the, the, the software on, and it works basically like this. Then we have some, some Linux clients here and some Linux servers. And we have some old machines there. We bought them 10 years ago. And so they had only one gigabit interface. And we take several of the machines with multiple interfaces, put them in the big switch, and go with 10 gigabit through those, those targets and measure how much, how much uh, forward or VPN performance we get there. And if you do that, it depends on how many other people are working simultaneously. Then the switch drops some packets or not. And you have 20% um, Variance in, in, in throughput depending on the phase of the moon or whatever. So, the, what I want, so what the, the problems are we have too many requirements, I told you at the beginning. We have too much complexi complexity, which is bad if you want to reliable numbers. And if you want to dig down what's, what's really the problem there, you have not enough flexible, flexibility because it's all set up in a static way. And other people are using it in, in, in parallel. And if you start moving the, the cables around and, and reconfiguring the switches, other setups break, or you don't have the, enough permissions to, to configure the, squid, the, the switch, or people complain when you remove some cables. So what I want to have as a setup is this. So I have an open Disney machine here. I have another open BSD machine here, and I have only a cable in between, no switch, no nothing. So there's much less things that influence 
my, my results and everything I measure is somehow based on the OpenBSD I want to get information about. So the other thing I had before um, is my regression tests. I worked on that, I started that I think four years ago, and I run the OpenBSD regression tests on a daily basis. Um, those regression tests existed before, they were just checked into the, the source tree and every developer could make, could do a make in some subdirectory and would pass or not. Um, but there was no um, regular execution of them and a lot of them were unmaintained or just failed. So what I started, I, I just took the test that already existed here and run them daily. I can run them on multiple architectures to have a comparison, how does it work on 32-bit or 64-bit. Um, and I'm planning to, to, to extend it on Spark when we have little engine, big engine. And what the nice thing is when you do it daily and, and record it and publish it on a, on a web page, that you get a history. You can say, okay, three weeks ago this test um, started failing, so what was going on there? I can, I can link that to the commit or to the source change that caused the problem. And that's something I also want to do for, regard, for the performance. And what I also do is, is collecting useful information. I create log files, you can download the object files from the, uh, from the test run, you can debug it more or less online, and if, if it's really complicated, you can also log in at the machine and, and do your, your analysis there. And everything is accessible, you just go to this website and can see the results of the, of the things. So here's how it looks like. I didn't do it. Hmm? I didn't do it. You didn't do what? Break. Ah. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't fix it. <laughs> um, so what, what we have here is, is, a, um, is a, a display of everything, and it's quite red because we have new architectures here. That's ARM v7 and ARM64. It doesn't crash during the test run. And I haven't spent too much time on those ARM platforms, so, so quite, quite a lot of them is red. But we are working on that. So what, what I show here, or what is told before, we, I want to have links and, and information on what's going on. So I put a lot of li links here. Here, for example, the run history. You can click on that and you see um, when each test was executed, how the machine was set up. So what I do there, I get a snapshot from OpenBSD every time, every day or so, Theodorat builds a snapshot with the current release, or no, not release, with the current um, software version, and I just install it on the machine. There's an auto-installer for OpenBSD, and I can just set it up. The config is static. Um, and here you can see how, how it installed and if they, if, if they broke anything, or if the auto-installer is broken, or if the snapshot has has some problem that we cannot install. So then I have a link here to this uh, CBS web of the test. So here are the, the, the tests. And you can just go in there and, and see, oh, did somebody commit something in the test? So that's the reason why it broke. Here I have some, some color um, scheme to show um, why what, what is wrong with the test. So pass is always green. We have red is failed. We have skipped. Um, that means there's some, something mis missing in the hardware setup, so it cannot run there. So we have architecture-specific um, tests. For example, here's a GCC test, and on ARM64, we don't have GCC, so we skip it. And there are some other reasons why I skip it. We also have some tests that, use, that uh, do something with the keyboard driver, and if there's no mouse attached, then it's skipped. And if you click on, on such a fail or on a pass, you get the, a link to the, to the log to the test output. So you can immediately see or get an idea why the test fails. So here I have a link to, to the, the, the logs of the setup of this specific day. So this is the day when, when, I, when I run it. When I run it, see this one is the most recent one. So make the slides last month. 
Um, and here every day you get four new architectures. And um, when you click on that, you get the logs, how it was installed, and you can also download the object files that were generated while the test was run. And perhaps you see, get some more information from that. And I also have a cron job to delete it at the end here. So I cut it a little bit, and here the test results are deleted so that the drive doesn't fill up. And here you can also click on it, you get a DMS from the machine and see what version was actually tested, who built the kernel, and what's, uh, what, what's, what's the test target. So what we gather from it, now I clicked on the only show me the IP86 tests. It's IP86 because that's the, the first architecture I started with. And so we have the history here when we did run the test. So we see, okay, this here has, has some problem forever. And here this lib crypto, something here between 13 and 15 went wrong. So here I have to start in, in, investigate. So those GCC um, uh, tests failed since we switched to the uh, Flang linker because it misses some features. And then, uh, so it basically checks whether there's some warning of some un unsafe functions are emitted by the, the linker. And that doesn't work currently. But Kaden has promised to, to, to fix it. And uh, here we have other tests that pass sometimes and fail sometimes. That basically means it's not a stable test. There should be some more investigation, make it more stable. So that's a fragment test. You send some, some uh, IP fragments with SCAPI to another machine, and maybe the, some packets get lost. And when they get lost, the test fails. And it's a little bit fragile. Or fragile. Uh, so but the other thing I do is, is I, I sort them here. So if something, um, so the, this test, I fixed it uh, four, four, days, four days ago. But if this test here, for example, it doesn't terminate. So it takes, just takes too long, and it takes more than an hour. After an hour, every test is aborted. And so it's this no term category. So we have some failures. They are sorted here. We have some paths here that they are, they fail in some other architectures. That's why they are sorted here. And here we have some, some skip tests. And and we have a lot of green passing tests down here, but I uh, cut it away from, from the slides because it didn't fit. And the interesting thing for, for the developers is, is that here. You should concentrate on that and fix that. So also, um, I run all the tests on, on hardware. So most of them are just running one machine. So we have some, some kernel installed here, some user level installed here, some tests here in user source. You just type make, and then something happens, and it either passes or fails. But there are some other tests that are more complicated. For example, I have a test that tests ARP, the ARP protocol, and um, they have a remote machine, and I send some SCAPI packets to it, some fake ARP, um, ARP packets, and look at the ARP replies and check whether, whether that fits. So you can do two the test with two machines. This one is, is, is controls everything. Here the test script is run, the make um, file is run, and it may log in with SSH to here to make some setup, and it may um, send some, some packets here that are do the actual test. And other tests that have more machines involved, the most complex one are testing PF, forwarding, redirection, and fragmentation. So I, I run the PF. The PF that is tested is basically run here. So I can send a packet here, then it goes through PF, gets modified or uh, reassembled, whatever test I'm doing here. Then it goes to a router. I need the router here because I want to do path and tube tests. So this router has a limit of um, path and um, NTU at the interface. It's only 1,300. So the the packet has to be fragmented somewhere here, if it's IPv6, or here, if it's IPv4. Then it hits to the server. The server is either just running a, the normal ping service of the, the kernel, so if it's a ping packet, packet it's just uh, returned. And it also runs the, the echo service on port 7. If it's a UDP packet, it's just returned. 
And there's also a TCP echo service. Um, you open the connection, everything you write in gets back out. So I can just write a TCP stream through this. And here it has to do some path MTU. Here the PF has to, to do some magic things. And then I get everything so back if it works. And if it doesn't get the data back, the test fails. So how do I set up that? I told a little bit about it. So I have this master here. That's also the web server. You can publish the results. And this master controls a serial console server that also handles all the installation. So here I can say, OK, install or upgrade all the machines. And it will um, uh, install the latest snapshot on these machines with the auto installer. And the OpenBSD installer allows to put a site TGZ, TGZ somewhere. That's where all the um, configuration files are in there. They are stored here. And here it gets all the configuration files and gets the IP addresses. And it's configured statically so that it's uh, set up to run those tests. OK, now we switch from uh, regression testing to performance testing. I did do it. What did you do? Fix the tests? <laughs> <laughs> so what do we want? First of all, we want to see the history. When did things get slower or faster? We want to be have reproducible results. So if I run the test once, get a number. If I run it again, I want to have the same number. That's pretty hard. Um, I want to have the details so I can see, OK, in which situation was the machine? Was everything set up correctly? Also see um, which, um, which commits were in that region and when did, what date of the, of the kernel was run there, what user land is running there. I want to have a drill down. So if I see, OK, uh, one month ago something broke or got slower, then I want to drill down and say, OK, which commit was it? Which hour was it? What, what did really cause that? And I want to have it somehow automatic, so I don't want to, to run everything manually. Um, the, the performance tests are run by a cron job, and it's just in the background, just needs a little bit of babysitting if something breaks. Hopefully, it doesn't break, doesn't, uh, and it, nothing breaks. And so I also want it here automatic. And I basically, I do the, the, the test runs manually now, but I have set up a cron job that always does the last week, uh, updates the last week of commits every week. So how does it work? Um, so the, the idea is I install an OpenBSD release, then I have a, a, a defined point where I can start from. I have a kernel installed, I have a user land installed, and it's publicly released, and every, everyone knows what it is. And then I check out the kernel at a certain date. So I want to test this kernel version. Then I compile it. I compile it on both machines. You remember, I have two machines with a table in between it, and I do the same thing for on both machines. So I compile it. Then I run the tests. And then I can, uh, I can have a delta how, how much I want to, to step forward. So it may be a day, or a month, or a week, or an hour. Usually, when I want a day, a day based setting is, is, a, is a good um, resolution. So I a step one day ahead and do the next checkout. Compile the kernel, run the test, and I do that until I'm at the end date that might be the next release. And then I correct, collect the results to make some, some statistics about it and, and, and present them. And you're not rebuilding the user plan? Oh, that's on the next slide. Oh. So basically, I want to avoid to uh, rebuild uh, user land because it takes forever. So compiling the kernel is two minutes. Compiling the user land is two hours. So how does the result look like? Basically, I copied the, the per code that, that generates those results from the 
from the regression test, so it looks quite similar. So what we have here is the run history, so you can see, okay, what, when, when was it installed and how was the kernel compiled and everything. Um, we have here some, some, some details in this line, I explain that later. Then here we have the, the tests I run. Basically, it's an iperf 3 from port system I install there. I run some TCP tests. It also has a minus R option that um, normally when you have an iperf server and a client, and the client connects to the server and all data is sent from client to server. And with minus R, it's in the other direction. And we run some TCP bench. It's TCP, TCP bench. Here it's uh, with 100 simultaneous connect connections. Here's only one connection. We run iperf with UDP and reverse. And I have two test setups. So we have one test up, set up with one kind of machine, and there's another IP address. The IP address is coded here somewhere. So the one machine is, is, is here, and the other machines, um, the test results are, are down there. But it's basically the same test. Then here I compile the kernel and measure the time how long it takes to convert the kernel. The main idea because that I do that is um, that I got, so what we did before, before we did such performance testing, people compile their, their, their machines. So, so developers compile their kernel, compile their, they use a land and they always say, oh, it's getting slower. And to, to measure that it's getting slower, I also just do a, um, a kernel compile, makes the make clean, and then it runs with J, J4 on a 4 CPU machine and J8 on a 8 CPU machine. And I also do some uh, disk uh, drive uh, file system performance, but uh, I'm not satisfied with that. I have to fine tune that. So, and now when you click, oh no, I forgot to explain this. So here we have the date when I run the test. Here it's the version I, I installed. So in this case, it's a 6.4 release. I installed it. And then I have the first CVS checkout that's here. So I started here at uh, 16th of March. And I stopped at 23rd of March. And it's uh, eight test runs in between with one day stack. And I repeated the test five times. Um, I'll give more detail about that later. So and if you click on, on, on one of those such test runs, so if you click here to get to the next slide, um, that shows what happened in one of those test runs. So, here you still, you again have those, those logs. You can look in more details. And here's the checkout date. So here, this um, test that it run in, in February, and I checked out October 2017. And here I checked out, it's been 4th October, that's 11th October, 18th October, so I have a week step. I stepped weekly through the 6th. Two release, I think. Yeah, here it's 6.2, it was installed, and I stepped weekly through it. So what I do now, I have the checkout date, and between um, this date and this date, there were 49 um, kernel commits. And if you click on the CBS log, you also see all the commits. I go through the CBS history and, and collect everything and show what was between here and here. Later there will be a slide where to show that. And then we have those build verbs. So as Bob asked already, what happens with user land? Um, I have to recompile the user land from time to time. The thing is that NetBSD can be compiled, the kernel can be compiled on any POSIX system. That's not the case with OpenBSD. The OpenBSD kernel um, requires that it's compiled and built on a system, on, on a user land system that matches more or less its state. And so I have to update the user land so that's compatible to the kernel. So basically what I have to do is um, recompile the kernel, uh, recompile the compiler, the Clang compiler, when it's updated. And that's also good performance-wise because I don't, I'm not only interested in the kernel performance, but I also want to know what do the compiler and its options have an influence on the performance. So I also uh, measure 
the, the, the important steps in using that. So every time I have such a build quirk, then I know, okay, here I have to do something with the user land. I'll explain that later in more detail. So, and now here, you have the numbers of this test, that's the iperf tcp in forward direction, and um, I repeat those tests multiple times to, to get more stable numbers, but my observation was that the, the test goes up and down and, and gets faster and slower, and so I try to do it here five times, and here present average number. It's not quite correct. Uh, for network performance throughput, I took the maximum number. So that's the maximum number. And um, when those um, repetitions give results that are not stable, that, that are jumping a lot, then I print them in red here. So this one has a lot of jumping in it. You see, it's, it's very red. So here we should look into more detail. So I get to the next slide. So if you click on the, on the top. Here. Here. Or here, here, we click here. Then you go to the details of all the repetition. So if you see here, um, it looks like here, here we have some still some block files. And here it's repeat one, zero, one, two, three, four. And here we have some strange, strange values. All of them are red. You can't read the numbers, but um, here it's uh, four gigabit throughput, and here it's only 1.6. So what, what happens? This is uh, eight core machines with two sockets. And these two socket machines are very unreliable performance-wise. Um, and it happens that once a while, the throughput goes down to 1.6 gigabit, and I don't know why. So if you reboot it, it goes up again. So you have Four, so it's three nine, four, three eight, one dot six, three eight. And if you reboot it, it gets into this state. And if you reboot it again, it gets out of it. I don't know why this happens. So here, here in, the, in the back, I um, calculate the standard deviation, and I also print it in red when it's too big, so I see um, easily where where is the problem, and report that to the other side. So it can also generate some graphs out of that. Um, so here we are, in, we install 6.2 here, and we run until 6.3, and we make one measurement every week. So as you told you, I have several tests that are um, shown as different symbols here. So there is a an explanation on, on the website, but it doesn't matter which test is which. And what you see here, um, we have this, that's the occasional 1.6 throughput, nobody knows why. And most of them are in this band here. You also see that the numbers are jumping up and down, so it's not one one line. Here we have one line, for, but here, here on top it's more or less. The different tests also give different results. And here, we have one test that's faster. I'll explain later what it is, but just remember that we saw it here. What I also do is those vertical lines, that are the quirks. When I have to touch user land to make the kernel compile again or to change the compiler or whatever, then I have such a quirk. I have a static file with the build quirks where I have a date. Where it says, okay, at this date we have to update the compiler and if the Previous test is before the date, and the next test is after the date. In the meantime, the compiler is recompiled. So here's a small example of the, the quirks I have had in the previous slide. So I, to, to make it easily detectable, I also have a, a line for the release date. I don't build anything there. I just want to show you where, where the release where was. So the first thing I had to do I wanted to check out the compiler, and I saw that there's a bug in CVS, and you cannot check out a vendor branch if there was a commit on a non-vendor branch later. Bug in CVS, so I fixed CVS, the tool, and added the patch to the quirks and recompiled CVS. Then I can check out uh, LLVM that was released 5.0 at that point, and recompile the kernel with that. 
What we also have is um, there's a header file that's called pfvar, um, where the pf structure is in there. So when we change the pf structure in the kernel, um, the pf ctl tool to change the kernel has to be compatible. Otherwise, kernel and tool are not uh, have the, don't have the same idea from the struct, and the update of the pf rule fails. And usually, you see that the performance difference because I um, I run it with pf with the default rule, and if during boot, the PF rules can be loaded. Then we have a different PF set. And then we see other performance. And so I, I figure out, when I look at the graph, oh, there's a problem. Then I add a quirk to say, OK, here, when we have the PF bar header file uh, change, then I have to recompile PFCTL. That's rather short. That's just a few seconds to recompile that. So the next problem we have, so um, somebody committed here a driver. And he made a mistake. Um, so the tree was broken. It was only broken for half a day or so. But if my measurement just hits that moment, um, it, it, it can't compile the kernel. So I have to look at the fix that's committed later and patch that in the sources that were before, and then it compiles again. So what did here? Here was another PFCTL change. SysCTL has the same problem. If the SysCTL structs change, then <coughs> it, it it doesn't work anymore, that may have some influence how the system was booted, what per, uh, what is the CLS per set during boot. So if that changes, I just recompile it. Here we updated LLVM again. Here we had some PF change. And here we had the OpenBC release. So that's how the quirks work. And that's the static file where everything, it's a per module where I've described all the things that change there. Bob, you look like you have a question. Why, why did you choose to just do the kernel and then kind of band-aid in user land to just make the kernel work? To make it fast. As opposed to just doing your own, like, make build. And you make build, 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 build so, so, so testing a release on a daily basis from one release to the next takes me more than a week. Okay. Only compiling the kernel. Yeah. Okay. And it would be 10 times slower if I compiled it. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, now here it's again in, in the in the in the state diagram how the the user land building works. So we come from here, check out the kernel, compile it, run the tests, advance, and now we have to look. Okay, was there at work? If not, we can just go check out the next state. If yes, we check out the user land at the date that's given in the build works, build our tool chain, and then continue here. As explained just before. So what I want to do next, what I already have is I don't have only one setup, I have two setups. The difference between the two is here I have uh, two sockets, eight cores, and here it's the same hardware with one socket, four cores. So I ripped out one CPU here physically, and then the performance numbers are much more stable. So running on a two-socket CPU is bad, especially if the open operating system is not aware of the CPU, um, of, of the, the socket uh, architecture and the NUMA and whatever. So what I also want to do, I installed the machine but nothing more, is to have a Linux here to, to make some performance tests and compare it to Linux. So then we have a stable Linux here, it's always the same, and we can look up what's the um, the difference when we only change this PC, <coughs> but it's it's not running yet. Just plans. So how does it uh, does the installation installation work? It's it's the same uh, setup as for the regression test, just different machines here. So have this master that publishes in, in the web. It says the console server, okay, install the release, installs it here, and installs it here. And from the master there comes the configuration. And there comes the recompile um, command. So it says, OK, here, log in, make, check out LLVM, check out LLVM, build it. It builds it in parallel. Um, and it goes here and says, run the test. So the, the running the test is done locally. You can just also just log, log into this machine and say, OK, performance run now. And then it, you will get. Um, you, you, you can look at the machine, how, it, how it's running the test, and what, what the kernel is doing, and what top is doing, and take some statistics there, 
So you can really dig into it. And that's a script that's just running here and doing all the, doing one test run. So it does the iperf test, the TCP then bench, the make timer, and the file system test. And it also locks may log in here and say, okay, here we start the iperf daemon as a receiver. Okay, now I have some results. <coughs> so you re remember the, the slides before? We had one that had a single um, performance peak, and it was weekly. What I did now is I did the same test, but I did it daily. So I just took, I think it's, Two weeks, yeah, it's 14 days. 14 days, and the daily the check uh, the thing here, we still have those those strange numbers of the two socket machines. We ignore that for now, and now we see ah, it's here, and I could look at all the CDS commits here and here, and I found out that uh, DLG, an OpenBSD committer, um, committed a TX mitigation here where he collects multiple. Um, packets and sends it to the network card once instead of um, doing the hardware output for every packet. And it was committed here, and it was back out here, back outed here, because it broke suspend on some resume on some laptops. So what I could see is okay, that's a very valuable, or interesting approach to to increase performance. Um, we just have to fix this problem. And I wrote DLG a mail, and he fixed it later. So then there's another thing. Did you see the performance increase when you put it back? Yes. Okay. That's on the later slide. <laughs> um, so what we, what we have now. Um, in OpenBSD, we recompile the kernel every time we reboot. So what I, I was <laughs> trying to figure out why we have such Changing numbers, especially on, sometimes it, it goes up and down, and especially in the second run. So I disabled the recompiling the kernel because recompiling the kernel is done in the background after the machine has booted up, and using starting some background jobs while you do performance testing is not a good idea. So I disabled it, and then I asked myself, what happens if I enable it? So I have three different things now. What I can do when I repeat the tests. So I come here, compile the kernel, then I run the tests. Then I can repeat them right? and run them again, and run them again, and run them again. Or I can say, okay, what happens if I reboot the machine in between? So I run the test, reboot the machine, run it again, reboot the machine, run it again, and go this way. Or I can say, okay, what happens if I relink the kernel? Relinking the kernel in OpenBSD means that we have a, a random sort order of all the object files. The idea why we do this is security. <coughs> We want to avoid um, that you can do blind drop uh, attacks. That you, when you don't know where the object files, how the object files are sorted within a uh, within a binary, it's very hard to guess where the gadgets are. You do it for for up, and um, that means you. It, it's very hard to exploit the kernel, and that's why we re relink the kernel in a random order at every boot. So every OpenBSD machine has a variation of the kernel layout. It's 1,600 object files, I think, and you have all <coughs> possible orders, so it's a very large, it's very hard to, 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 to hit the, the right ordering. So I, I, I try to do that. So now what happens? I compare the results. So we have, <coughs> um, here I install 6.4, run it for five days, do 10 tests each, and keep the machine running at each test. So here, that's 10 tests executed here, 10 here, 10 here, 10 here, 10 here. And in between, I recompile the kernel and I do the TBS checkout, but it's just after the release. Here's the OpenBSD release, and we were in the kernel lock, and no, nothing performance relevant has been committed there. So either there was nothing committed or just some other things. And what you see, it's, it's going up and down a little bit, but it looks quite stable. Then what happens if I reboot the machine between tests? You see it's going a little bit more, spreading a little bit more, but it looks quite similar. And that happens if I relink the kernel and sort uh, and reorder the object files. 
you see it's a, it's a large spreading here, and I guess that's uh, the locally, locality of the, of the caches, where we cache the, 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 execute, the, the instructions. And if you reorder the instructions, the, the cache locality is bad or at least random based on the, on the layout of your column. So what you have to care about when you do performance testing, you have one kernel, test it, get a number, then you apply it, patch, recompile it, test it again. You may see this variation and not the patch you're testing. You, you have to repeat the testing, doing it multiple times to see the band of the one the, the band of the one target and compare it with another band that might be up, above or below. Just by recompiling the kernel, you get variation. When you were rebooting the machine there, you were rebooting the machine with kernel relinking on reboot to say. Yes, I disabled the relinking every time. Otherwise, the or relinking. The same number, the fuzzy number. Yeah. And, and the relinking would run in background when I run my tests. Yeah. That would be bad also. So I did, uh, disable relinking and relink explicitly if I turn it off. So it's just yeah. doing it in the front of the test printer. So, and now I go back to my two CPU socket machines, so that's the eight core machine, because I have another effect here. So I install uh, 6.4, I do the test for 15 days, it's five tests each, and we have one line here, and we have another line here sometimes. So what's that? It's another unexplainable phenomenon. So when I click on the, the tables, I see here in the second cycle that I have those red numbers. And I have only the red numbers here and here and here and here. Um, so, and it's always that. It, it doesn't matter which one I take, I just have to, to, to select one of those with, with those ghost numbers here. And if I click on it, I see this result. Here it's red and there it's red. So the second run is slower. So I reboot here. As a keep, that means I don't reboot the machine. And here it's slower, and it's only slower when I'm sending in forward direction. This is a minus R. That means the iperf is sending the packets in the other direction. That's not affected. But if I send it in the forward direction, it gets slower. And what I figured out is I run the tests in sequence. So I do the, the, the network test, and then I run a kernel compile with minus J8. And this minus G8 means that I have eight compilers running on all cores, and it affects the statistics that are relevant for scheduling. And after I compile the kernel, the iperf is scheduled on another core and another socket, and then the performance drops, which didn't happen before. Okay, that's halfway explainable. What's even more strange is if I compile the kernel again, this effect goes away. Then they are always uh, scheduled on the first socket, and then I have a maximum performance again. So I asked several developers, I asked Tennis, and he couldn't believe that it is that way, and I asked NDI, and he thought that's very strange, and gave me two diffs that, and for the scheduler that didn't change anything. So that's an ununderstood effect. So what did I do next? I did run from 6.3, that's here, to 6.4, that's here, and that's 202 days. It's a day resolution here. So you see the colors are different. The reason is that, that I used the other machine. So I ripped out one of the, those, those sockets, <coughs> and those CPUs from the sockets, because they had those unreliable results. And that's same hardware, but only one s CPU with four cores. And then we don't have those ghost numbers here. We don't have the second line here. Um, so what happens here? We, we install it here, and here it goes down. I don't know why. And this N, there we um, added red line. Red line is a, um, a, spe a spectral mitigation recommended by Intel. 
And here in N, I recompile the compiler and set it um, that it enables has the dreadful line workaround and um, enabled in the kernel compiler and you drop the policy. So I don't know what this is. That's probably a measurement error. Then I went on, and here we enabled witness. Witness is a, um, a debugging tool to find out if there are any log ordering problems in the kernel. We got it from NetBSD, uh, from FreeBSD, sorry. We got it from FreeBSD, and it um, saves some stack traces in the background, does some checks on, on, um, on locking, and if there's a problem, it panics and gives you a result. So it was just a debugging thing that we enabled it during the release, uh, during the development cycle, um, to get some, some results so that users who use snapshots see um, that the, you see those stack traces and report them and we can fix it. Is pool debug on? Pool debug is always off. Okay. I've set the sysctl to, so I have a bunch of sysctls that turn off anything that may, might affect performance. I try to be very fast. Um, except for one thing in the BIOS, I disabled the CPU turbo thingy. So CPUs can change their CPU speed and when it's cool. And I say, okay, don't do that. Don't get higher when it's cool. Just keep the same level to make the numbers constant. But in the kernel, I disabled all the debugging aids like pool debug and with the sysctl to get stable numbers. Because normally for release, we disable it and, and before we enable it, and you would see a jump here, but I, you don't see it. Yeah. I've disabled it already. So what we get here is we turned on witness. The next one here is we enabled red poline. No, not red poline, uh, red protect. So red protect is a feature from, um, from Mortimer? Red guard. Red guard. Red guard. Sorry, red guard. Um, so it's red guard. So it um, adds some additional checks at the, when we uh, leave each function um, to see if the stack pointer has been changed. And that gives a little bit of overhead. That happened here. And what we did here is we turned off witness again. So witness was just a, a temporary experiment to see um, uh, how, do we have locking problems in the kernel? We turned it on, got some reports, fixed some stuff, turned it on again, so we went back here. So we have what, what, what stayed here is red poline and red guard. So here I've added reference counting to the PCB. Let's think of it like a socket data structure in the kernel. So they are reference counted now, and I think that's this little performance drop here. Because it uses atomic operation, it's some synchronization between the CPUs. So now we go on, that's the next release. That's from 6.4 to 6.5. So here we are in April this year. Performance wise, there did not much happen, except for the age. I forgot it. Sorry, I forget the, forgot the age, I have to look it up. What it happens here is at the I. Uh, no, it's an L, it's a small L. Um, there we disabled stack protector if red guard is enabled. So the red guard is the more paranoid check in the stack. And then you don't need the stack protector anymore because everything the stack protector could find, red guard could also find. That's a little performance optimization that may be related to that. The main problem is that we don't see precise numbers, but we always see this band. And if it, there's a huge change, we can see it. But if it's, if it's only a little bit, it's, it's hard to see and hard to guess what's going on. Ah, I remember what page is. We added um, some feature that we, so we, we, we get kernel stack traces. We get a report from our user, we see them in EDB. And some architectures print the arguments um, that were for the functions when you call them. And for example, i386 does it because it saves them on the stack and you see them on the stack. AMD64 doesn't do that because everything is past the registers and the stack trace cannot find the register values. And then we added a feature that we print and that we write the register values to the stack so that we can see the arguments that were passed to the function from the stack trace and we enabled it here. So that's the H. 
It's a little, a small drop. So now we have 65. And as I told you, I create the, the slides here. So that's my last <laughs> measurement. And you remember the TX mitigation from DLG? I wrote in my mail, it says, OK, it has a performance um, uh, increase. And DLG said, OK, let's try to make it in a way that doesn't break Claudio's laptop. Because it was Claudio who reported it in an ICP, so it got back out. And here he implemented it again, and we see, see the same jump that we saw two releases before. And we have it. And it was back out. It's still there. Ah, yeah, what I wanted to tell you about the CVS lot. So between every measurements, I go to the CVS and get all the, the and, and sort all the changes to that are relevant between those checkouts. So I have the, the begin checkout, that's the, me, the first measurement, and the second checkout, and everything in source sys that was committed there, that was eight commits, and they are all consecutive here. And I show which files were, were touched, and you can click on the diff, and you go to the CDS web and can look at the diffs of the file, and here you see the commit message, and here is the TX mitigation. That's the one that increased the performance. So you can just from from the from the table, it's one click to this, and you see what was going on between the two kernel between between the two kernels. So I want to summarize my findings. Okay, all this measuring sucks. It's a lot of work, and it's strange things going on, and it's hard. Multi-socket multi CPUs suck performance-wise, especially when, when you want exact precise numbers. Um, reproducing numbers is very hard. And even if you do, it's quite unclear what are the effects behind it. Do not trust your numbers. Test it again. See that you can reproduce it and keep the setup as simple and stupid as you can. Otherwise, you don't have a chance to, to get the, the cause of the, of the changes, because you have too much complexity. So what can, else can be done? Um, nowadays, I'm only testing between two OpenBSD and the, the stacks. I could also add another machine and measure some forwarding. I can set up this uh, Linux machine I've showed, we've shown before and, and use this as a client server. So I have one stable Linux release and test all OpenBSD variants between it. Or I could use FreeBSD if you like. Um, then the UDP test, I, I run UDP tests, but those numbers really suck. It's quite hard to say what does it mean if you get a number in UDP because do you measure what you're sending or what you're receiving? And if you send too much, the kernel is busy with freeing things without receiving things. And the iperf tool, I installed the iperf tool of the release version. I have three different versions of iperf there. And they all have different algorithms to measure UDP. So that's there, there's potential to improve. Um, so what I also want to do is, is when I get a diff, then I want to see, does this diff make the performance better or not? And I, but I have no. Uh, way to, to do that automatically right now. So what I would want to do is put the diff in there, run the test, and have a website that says, okay, with diff, diff this, and without the diff, something else. Um, I want to go farther back with releases, look at 5.9, um, just comparing them. The file system performance, the main problem with this machine is that we have a RAID controller there, it's an LSI controller, which doesn't like the driver and the firmware, and the performance is really bad. And um, so either I have to change the, the RAID controller or fix the driver or take another hardware, and then I can do a more reasonable file system performance. And then this line I added last week, because um, we have this band of, of results because of the sorting of the kernel. And I should add another mode where I sort the kernel object files in a constant way so that I try to get more reliable numbers, even if I apply patches or change the checkout date. 
So I didn't do everything on myself. I had some help. So there was Jan Klemko, he does the hardware administration for all the machines and creates the, the possibility to set up that. Then Moritz Buhl is a student working for me and he did all the guts with uh, Uniplot to get those nice graphs so I didn't have to dig into that. And Genua, my employer, is hosting the machines, giving the electricity and gave me work time for that. So I have some links for you. So that's the, the top level thing. Here you can find the results of the rigorous test, the results of the performance test. You can also get the raw data of the performance test. It's all in GNU plot format, but just, just the numbers down there. And then the GNU plot scripts get the, the right numbers out of it to create the graphs. I've committed the Perl scripts that create that on GitHub. This is the, um, the scripts that do the installation of the, the hardware ma the machines. And that's the source code of those LaTeX slides. And that's the final slide with the questions. Bob first. How soon before you get, like, how much did we break it at this hackathon? Performance or hackathon? I mean, performance after hackathon. I didn't run that yet. Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to? Sure. I want to know how, bro how much we broke it. Yeah, so, so I was repeating another measurement, and, then, and those machines are busy right now. Okay. So here, you could do the next. Yeah. Could you characterize what the user source tests for those of us not familiar with OpenBSD user source tests? You mentioned tests. Um, regress. 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 Yeah. Regress. Um, so everything a developer thought would be nice to test. So we have regression tests for Libre uh, SSL, for example, where you test the crypto things. Um, we have. Oh, it's so much. We, we, we test those libraries. Two examples. I have written some tests for syslog. I rewrote syslog more or less. And I test all the things. We test CLS there. Test that no syslog messages get lost. I have a relay daemon test. Um, so we have user led tools testing. Probably, hmm? If you think about if you think about it from a, a, a test Nazi perspective, you might call some of them uh, component tests. So to, to give you an example from Libre SSL, We'll have places where we've decided we know what our what exactly what should come out of a TLS handshake at these steps, and so there's literally hex encoded bytes of what the handshake should be, and we run it and we compare the output. That would be like a component test, and yet you've probably got something more along the lines of a of a unit or an integration test. So we 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 brought Bloom over and fed him a lot of steak, sat him on my couch. And he worked with the ports people and got it to where, in, the, in that same regression test, there's also stuff that effectively got it where we could run, have all the versions of OpenSSL installed along with LibreSSL and do uh, compatibility tests connecting between all of those. So it's kind of a, it's everything from like component tests for functions to effectively almost, uh, you might call it end-to-end -end or compatibility tests. There's a lot of stuff in there. Anything for file? Oh, yeah. yeah, we also we, we copied the file system test from FreeBSD. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so there is like, and I, I rewrote it so that they also run on NFS. Yeah. So they run on NFS and, and um, uh, NFS, and that's the, the test that Bob just mentioned. Here it's, I run the, 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 the client and server code. Here's a client SSL client server, and I compile it with Libre SSL, Open SSL, and SSL 1.1, and do a cross. Um, an interoperability, interoperability test. So I take the same binary, compile it with three kinds of libraries, and take the other side and compile it with three kinds of libraries and do all tests. So yes, here. Yeah. So the band that you're always talking about is in the three, three gigabit per second range? Yes. Uh, and uh, So we started at four. <laughs> <laughs> I was back up to three and a half. That was before when I started. So, but uh, how do we? How how do I get more? Do I get a faster CPU? Do I link the logs? Or do you I you help removing the big logs in the OpenBSD cards? <laughs> okay. And and the socket, the, the dual socket, is that again related to some the same? Is there is that also related to uh, limitations uh, in our? Uh, kernel or yeah. 
so, so uh, the basic problem in, in the OpenBSD kernel, and, and that's why I did that, because we want to get beyond, beyond the point, is that we have a locking that only allows you networking on one CPU at, at the same time. Okay. So, and you have a lock contention there, and uh, that's why this is locked. Yes? Is there any benefit to running these tests on like smaller hardware, like APUs? Does that expose something that, let's say, a faster Intel processor might just gloss over or, or what's their cost now? So, uh, I have a, a rather old machine there. So, that's a Xeon Pro, uh, machine from 2012. So, in, at Genoa, in the OpenBSD lab, I collect all the hardware that nobody else needs anymore and, and run my test there. And it more or less doesn't matter. For the regression test, it doesn't matter at all. And for the um, Performance test, yes, I need a machine with a lot of CPUs to make the, the CPU problem visible, but if it's 10 years old or very expensive, the new shits doesn't matter much. Because we have, I'm concentrating to, to get the, the, the kernel limitation solved, and there it's not that important what hardware you are running on. Does that answer your question? Uh, it was more just that it, would an embedded processor expose more problems than, let's say, a really fast processor? Kind of. I would say we are not at that point currently. Okay, thank you. Is any reason you're testing in bits per second rather than packets per second? Is it more typical for throughput testing? Basically, because the tools uh, have that output. Okay. Doesn't matter much. That's just I know the or yeah, yeah. Have a, not an, an understanding of order of magnitude numbers I expect from the previous stack. Mm -hmm. Interesting to compare. Mm -hmm. Oh no, don't don't compare it. Do the how much of these tests is automatic and how much of it do you have to do things manually to kick them off? So uh, for the the the, performance, the regression tests run every day per call. Yeah. And the performance tests, I um, I just go to the website. <coughs> Wait a minute. Yeah. So, uh, for some reason, there is a. So what I do here, I have a cron job that repeats the the last week. <coughs> So what, what, what I do is when I say, okay, I want to, to test the release, I have a, a make line, and it, it's, a make, it's controlled by make file. So I can say, okay, do, the, do this here, make something, and then I can fine tune it. So the, the make line, is, so I can make it in minus n, then it prints the line, and then there it says, okay, it's, it's, it's a day step, and I change the day to three hours, and I stay, change the start and the end, and then, then I fire it off, so the releases I do manually. But what I've added is a, a cron job that does the last week here. So every week, every Friday, I get the daily resolution of the last week. And it adds then to the, to the total slide. So that's the, the slide with all the measurements. You see here. And, um, and then you can click on the, the other ones. And you have the, 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 the singular measurements. And you, you always add the last one here. And that's the, the blue one is the, the eight, eight core machine. And you see it's slower than the, the four core machine. Because we have this big lock, and then it's scheduled on the wrong core, and then we have more lock contention, and then it gets slower. By the way, also have some make outputs. That's UDP, and that's total cramp, and that's. No, no offer benefit. So okay, go, go, go. Because I noticed this earlier. The UDP? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at how much the, the, the blue one is falling off. There. Don't, don't, don't trust the UDP. Don't trust the UDP. Don't trust the UDP. So that's the other machine. That, that's the 8-core the machine. Eight core, yeah, that's that's the 8-core. I don't know what that is. Maybe that the TX mitigation made faster for TCG yeah, and slower for UDP. UDP yeah, but, yeah, okay. but, but that's just a guess. Yeah. So, so UDP is, 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 is crap. Anyway, I get 1 or 2 gigabit. I don't know why. The, uh, the tool is, is printing that. Yeah. The older version of iperf 
um, printed completely different format, so they are missing here. We get two releases missing because the, the output format has changed and the change the, how they interpret the, the, the lost packets. Okay. okay, we have a question there. Is there any reason you're using iPad instead of TCP band? Oh, I wanted to have multiple tools to, um, to see if one tool has a bug. Okay, but you're using TCP band as well? Or yes, yes, yes. Okay. So what, what, what can you do here, Moritz? Who made it? I have this. There you go. Image somehow. <coughs> oh. All flat. Ah, it was not much nicer here. You have to scroll in the stuff. There you go. Ah. Crap. Why is it so crappy? <laughs> Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> Now it worked. So I have to go to the. No, it must be there somewhere. So, so it's brought out. So normally you have here. Perhaps when I make it bigger. So now I have it. So you can have the TCP bench only. You can click on this and the iPerf vanish. And now we are only testing TCP batch. Oh, now you can't see the interesting part. So they have to move it this way. There we go. Yep. Okay, so, so you can you can choose what, what measurements you want to see. And and we can and that's it. So so blue and and purple ones are the eight cores and the others. On the four course, and I made several measurements, and this is the, the summary. Everything is in that slide. One more question. Are you wrapping this all in APF or QA, KYU, QA, or some test framework? How do you launch all this? No, there, there's not much framework. It's everything written by myself. You may want to consider turning off witness for your performance tests, because my experience with witness has been that it distorts reality. It, it is off. Okay. It, so um, I always set the sysctl to turn it off. Yeah. But um, just it compiling out. it in made it slow. Yeah. So that, that's that's the, the thing you saw there. But it had no particular way to, to, to patch it out. And I also wanted to show what's the thing that the people who built the kernel at that time see. Yeah. So FreeBSD has an explicit big uh, disclaimer when we uh, boot up with witness and in the configuration file mm -hmm. because certain idiots or no run tests with witness enabled and then complain about bad performance. Witness is a fantastic tool for mm -hmm. log order reversals, but if you're interested in performance, turn it off because it'll be garbage. Yeah, yeah yes, indeed. And then here it shows it clearly. So that's witness. Yes. Yeah. Um, when you were probably looking at T Rex. Uh, Jan from Cisco, just to stop thinking the database were, were just generating the lowest system mm. realistic, like using TCP lower rather than using hyper. Um, and we, we, we use those um, packet generating tools yeah. for in, in, in the company for our forwarding and VPN uh, tests for our product. And we have a, um, a network stack that works in parallel there that we get much higher performance. But for OpenBSD, as, as I'm doing TCP here, that's, that's really hard with those uh, packet generators. Yeah. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm using stack performance. I'm not doing forwarding performance here. And doing a real TCP, they, they don't do a real TCP handshake and, and generate packets there. And so here I'm, I'm just running OpenBSD with itself. And every problem I see is somehow hidden in the OpenBSD. Yeah. Well, more, sorry, more for the UDP ones as well, mm. that you can get this, like a large yeah. amount of packets Mm. Um, but there's still the problem if you measure the stack. What do you measure? Do you measure the, the number of packets that hit the stack or that are received by the system? And if you send more packets to the stack, you will receive less yeah. packets in the user land because the kernel is busy throwing them away. Okay. If you're testing the forward performance on the, uh, with UDP, with, uh, let's say, so Microsoft has it, just the cheap. Generator that they have, like the TPP database as well, or mm. 
And what they do is they, they, they send out a warning to this, and they're, they're counting that, and then they're counting mm. it back, so you put it through your system, so you get, like, you could do your RFC mm. at least 15 part four, you know, like, ball back in, it's like, yeah. four byte, mm. five other byte. Yes. Yes, that's that's more suitable for forwarding. Forwarding. I didn't do forwarding yet, and you also have to be careful. Um, so what 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 we do at Genua, we say we increase the sending rate until one percent of the packets get lost, and we take the receiving rate of that, and that's our UDP performance. But that's not that what the iCurve tool is doing there. So, so perhaps I just write in our own tool and for the stack or. Even within iPerf 3 itself, I've seen a lot weirder stuff on FreeBSD in the last year or two than I had seen in the past. Just, just stuff not wanting to work, stuff getting locked at magical bottlenecks and stuff that even, not just about iPerf 2 versus iPerf 3, because that's a whole nother monster. But I just wanted to throw that out there for anyone in the room. Mm. So what, what's possible with that? Um, I can repeat those tests easily. So I can I have a script that, that runs all the tests. It's not a big deal to add another test and run the whole thing in the past again because I can generate the history at every moment. So any more questions? Okay, no questions. Thank you.